So we just heard Pilate in the gospel reading ask, what is truth? Imagine that question's feeling even more relevant these days. I was thinking about as we move toward Thanksgiving and these foundational stories about the nation that there is some looking at, well, what are the truths that we tell or what are the truths that we leave out? I was thinking about how I learned the story, several sources, but one important source for me in my younger days was Schoolhouse Rock. These were animated shorts that were shown in between the Saturday morning cartoons. And if you have missed out because you're either too young or older, they're all on YouTube. <laughs> and there was one I was thinking about moving toward Thanksgiving. It was called The Tea Party. And it starts with the Mayflower, splishing and a splashing, as the, these were all set to music. Splishing and a splashing over the horizon. They're looking for a free country, the song sang. There are all kinds of things left out, by the way, of this version. The only mention or, or nod that there were any indigenous people at all says they landed at Plymouth Rock, and then there's a couple of cartoon Indians. That's it. And then the, the colonies are populated. They build their houses. And the whole point of it, though, is that they, at first they're like, we love you, England. Send money. Send help. And then it becomes, you know, we want to be on our own. That's how the story is being told. And then there's the tax on the tea and the biggest tea party in history, the song sings. But it ends with this line, uh, no more king. We want a president. No more king. We're going to do things our way. No more king. No one tells us what to do. And I was thinking about that because that likely resonates as some kind of truth for lots of Americans. No one tells us what to do. And I was also thinking about, I grew up in the United Church of Christ, the congregational side. And by the way, Diane, I just have so many memories of sitting with my grandmother on the Sunday before Thanksgiving in church with the reverberation of the organ with come, ye thankful people come. So thank you for bringing that back for me and for the beautiful playing. And, and so though it, that, that in the congregational side especially, but in the UCC we don't have uh, a pope or a bishop, and I'll hear it said among UCC folks, no one tells us what to do. And so I think about, well, what did no one tells us what to do Americans, and no one tells us what to do UCC folk do with Jesus talking about kings and reigning powers, and that that somehow matters? Well, we don't have a king, even as there are people who would like to be, but we don't have a king but we do have powers that reign over us, whether we're always conscious of them or not. We all showed up here dressed. <laughs> right? There's cultural conditioning. There's religious upbringing. There's the family systems we're part of. Whatever economic system we grew up with. What parts of the country or what parts of the world. All that influences us. How we see the world. How we move. How we think. How we act. We have many of us places of trauma in our lives. And so there are powers that reign over us or in us. So I invite you for a moment. Consider what reigns over or in you. And then... The next question, how's that working for you? How's that working for you? Now recognize we can have different answers and maybe different times in our lives, different answers. So some of us might be saying, not so great. That's part of why I want to worship in a community or, or worship online or connect with some sort of higher power, looking for a better way. And some of us, when you hear the question, how's it working for you? You might think, all right, I'm doing okay have some success, can feed the family, we took a nice vacation. I mean, whatever ways we might answer, and those are all legitimate ways to respond to that kind of question. How's it working for you? But if we're in that camp of, well, it's working okay for me, then the follow-up question is, how's it working for everybody else? Now, that's not always the, the I'll call it the American question, but it's certainly the question for f people who want to follow in the way of Jesus. Because Jesus is really clear. First commandment, love God. Pay attention to God. Second commandment, love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. And Jesus also lets us know the neighbor is not just next door. But the neighbor is anyone in need. The neighbor can be the stranger, the refugee, even your enemy, Jesus says. Love them. And so we also have to ask the question, 
how is what maybe is working for me, how's that working for everybody else? I remember back when smartphones first came out, and there was someone I knew, she loved her smartphone. Loved it. She'd already had a cell phone, but she loved the smartphone because she was very efficient, and the least efficient part of her life, she said, was her commute in the morning. You're just stuck in traffic, can't get anything done, and the smartphone changed that. Not only could she talk to people, she could text people, she could read emails and send emails. And yes, of course, some of what she was doing was not legal. <laughs> but she would say, who's it hurt? Well, that got answered when the lane in front of her slowed down quickly and she rear-ended a car in front of her while she was reading email and did physically hurt the person in front of her. So sometimes what works for us isn't really working for those around us. I mean, soaring pandemic numbers would be evidence of some of that at work right now. But, but I'll, I'll offer an example that maybe covers most of us. Because it's easier to look at, well, those people, and I can see, like, cell phone women, right? But, so just one example. In our culture, there's this idea that if we can afford it, we should have some sort of home with space around it. This is familiar? And that, that is cultural, because there's other cultures and societies, that's not what they're aiming for, that's not what they dream about, but it's part of the American dream. I, by the way, ha I have a house with space around it, and sometimes I wish there was more. It's one of those packed together neighborhoods where I hear everything my neighbor says if the windows are open. But still, there's this idea, that's what we should do. And then as we keep getting more people, well now we're going to need more land in which to put all those houses and so, sometimes we're plowing over farm fields, sometimes we're cutting down forests, sometimes we're encroaching on desert land where there's already not enough water. And so, it hurts, right? It, it reduces environmental resources, etc. And we create communities where everyone needs to get in a car to get anywhere. Hi, Tucson, right? I mean, that's how our community is built. And so then it requires really to do anything to put more carbon, right, out into the air. And so, and, and now, of course, climate change, I know some people want to argue it's still just a theory, but every other day you're hearing about the unprecedented weather event that's happening, the shifts that are happening. Now, for a lot of us, all right, we're still, though, mostly okay. But the, the idea is where's the future headed? But even right now, people who are most vulnerable, the people in the poorest nations, they're already being devastated by the effects. Now, all right, I recognize we're coming up to Thanksgiving. We just want some comfort, pumpkin pie, mashed potatoes, and Michael, you've questioned our whole way of building society. I, I, I want some comfort too, and we need some comfort. I, I need to honor that. But also, it's helpful there's no simple answer to what I was just describing, but it's helpful to have some awakening to the powers that reign over us so that we can choose intentionally. And that's what the stories are inviting us to do. So I think about the psalmist that Tom read the psalm you heard this morning. The psalmist is claiming God's reign. The psalmist is wanting to pay attention to God's power reigning. And the psalmist also is acknowledging in the psalm that other powers reign and it creates chaos, it creates messes, it can create destruction. Anyone remember what a primary symbol in the Bible for chaos is? Water, storm, sea, yes. So there's this description, roaring waves, tumult. Does that ever feel familiar? Right, we know those conditions. And I'm not just talking literally. So we know those conditions of the overwhelm, the tumult, the chaos. And sometimes we think, well, what can we do about it? And we feel powerless. And it is what it is, we'll say. But the psalmist is saying, you know, we've maybe lived in ways that create such conditions, but God is greater than the crashing waves. God is greater than the tumult of the storm. God is greater than the chaos. And the psalmist is hearkening back to the creation story where there's this unformed sea, the chaos, and God speaks and moves and brings new life, brings creation out of the storms, out of the chaos. That, that there is this chaos and things that are destructive and hard, and there can be the responses that just sort of suppress it or push it over here. Or the psalmist is saying, or God reigns, and we create new life, new possibilities out of the chaos, out of what is destructive, out of what is harmful. And it's never quick and easy. 
but it's the process that we can get in on. And that's what Jesus is inviting people to get in on. Jesus, he grew up in the same world, different time and place, same world though that we do where there's lots of other powers that reign. Family system. And we get some stories. They were a piece of work, some of his family members. Right? Family systems, religious systems, socioeconomic systems. He's influenced like all of us are. But in the stories, Jesus chooses to not just unconsciously live into those other reigning powers. And Jesus seeks first the reign of God. He seeks God's power, God's justice, God's love, God's generosity. That's what he chooses to put in before him. That's what he chooses to eter- internalize. That's what he chooses to embody. And he invites other people to get in on it. And so Jesus lives in ways that are generous and creative and healing and beautiful and just. And we're still talking about him 2,000 years later. And he says to other people, you can get in on this too. You can seek first this reign of God. Come follow me. I'll show you how. So that's what Jesus is living into, this reign of God. And inviting other people to let God's power of love, justice, healing reign in us and through us. But the old systems, the old powers, the old ways, they don't just disappear. Even when we choose or get in on this way that Jesus is talking about, or this way of the Spirit. Last week we were talking about the neural pathways that are always still there. This week we can also pay attention to uh, entrenched systems that don't just like fall apart as soon as we say, I want to live into something better. And often the entrenched systems or the people part of those systems resist any kind of change or transformation, even if it would be better. And so we come to this part of the story that represents that conflict where Jesus is having a conversation with Pontius Pilate. Pilate is the governor in the territory where Jesus is and represents the Roman Empire. And for first century Jewish people who are telling these stories, Rome is the epitome of the other powers reigning. They are the fullness, the embodiment of other powers reigning. This is what you get. And Rome, remember I was mentioning chaos, what Rome does is they reign in ways that often create harm or destruction for other people. And then sometimes there's other chaos or wars or things stirred up. And Rome's way is to try to stomp it down. But it usually just displaces it somewhere else. Like if, that's why I think water is this great metaphor. You can't just push water down and it's gone. It just goes spreading out somewhere else. So an example of how this would work with Rome, but any empire it fits. So Rome sets up economic systems that create disadvantage for the lesser nations around them. So they create the system that then isn't working for the people around them. And then the people have resentments. The people want to get rid of Rome. The people want to break alliances with Rome. And so it it raises up maybe guerrilla warfare or what the empire would call terrorists or people start a rebellion. So Rome, they don't like that kind of thing. So what does Rome do when there's a rebellion or people are having guerrilla warfare? Rome or the empire comes in and will squash it with all of their might, with all of their force. And so then what happens in the land where that was happening is now the land is devastated. And then the regular citizens, they've lost infrastructure, they've lost resources, they're desperate. And so then those people go trying to pour into some place with resources, like within the empire. And the empire says, we don't want your kind here. Even though they started the whole system that created, right, just displacing the chaos. So that's how often the empire works. And that's what's symbolized in Pilate. So then Pilate has Jesus before him and asks him, are you a king? And Jesus, my paraphrase is, not like you mean it. There's power at work here, but it's not the power that just stirs up or displaces the chaos. It's the power that converts out of chaos, new life, new creation, new possibilities. And then Jesus says, The reign I'm part of is a reign of truth. Which brings us back full circle. Pilate, what is truth? And by the way, you can tell he's asking out of a place of privilege. Right? There's that sort of philosophy. Like, what is truth? Sort of that coffee house conversation, the sitting around the dorm room, right? Where you're mostly okay and comfortable. What is truth? Jesus is with a bunch of people who are like, I don't got time for that. They care about truth. 
but not in just some sort of philosophical way. The Hebrew word for truth, emet, the language, the religious language of Jesus, emet has a sense of to support something. And for Hebrew people, it's to support God or God's way. So for Jesus, truth isn't just a philosophical proposition. Truth is being part of whatever God's doing. Truth is being part of what God would want or vision or dream about for the world. And that's what Jesus is up to. That's the kind of reign that he's about. And Jesus is saying that kind of reign creates new life, brings resurrection, hope, healing, justice. And he says, and those who listen to my voice can get in on this truth. And so that, to kind of translate to modern UCC talk, God is still speaking. How can we be part of that kind of truth? Well, we do all the things we know to listen for how God is still speaking. Whether it's the better stories that we're trying to pay attention to, the meaningful conversations, the times of contemplation, hearing the resonance of a bell ring, right? There's different things that can open us to hear, to ponder, to be centered, but that helps us get in on what God's doing. And that's what Jesus is here to teach people to do. And he's saying it's a much better way. I remember this was quite a few years ago, but it was in the, the week leading up to Thanksgiving, someone was talking with me about how for him, Thanksgiving had become a spiritual practice. And he explained that through most of his life, Thanksgiving was the holiday. And uh, Thanksgiving was also, if you felt really thankful, you might say thank you to God or to someone else. And that was kind of it. He said in that faith community, it was re from retreats and study groups and worship services, he started to understand Thanksgiving as something that he could practice every day. Whether he felt thankful or not, he could still practice being mindful of what he'd been given and to say thank you to God, but also to other people. And that that was a, a, had become a daily practice for him. And he said, but also... The most important part of the practice for him, he had learned in one retreat, was to, after saying thank you, then ask prayerfully for him, what are you calling me, God, to do with these gifts you've entrusted to me? I've just named what I'm thankful for. What am I being called to do with these gifts entrusted to me? And in the ways he knew, he would then leave time and space to listen, to discern. He said that was a game changer because he was doing this every day. And he said, it's not like every day I had some brilliant idea and went marching off, clearly helping with the kingdom of God. He said, but what started to happen is I just got more of a sense of generosity and clarity. And he said, and I knew about this part of the story. He said, you know, that agency that we're partnered with when they had the opening for a volunteer to help families create budgets and do financial planning. He said, you know, I'm a financial planner and I only do that with rich people, but I figured it might translate. So uh, I felt in my prayer and my listening, go do this. He said, so I did it. And I've been doing it. And he said, and I was one of those people, I hate to admit it, that I'd sometimes think about, oh, the poor, they're just lazy. Or the poor, they're just wanting handouts. And he said, I don't doubt there are people like that, but every family I worked with, they just had really horrible circumstances. And one thing after another, they weren't lazy. They were there because they were wanting something better for themselves, for their families. So I got to have relationships with people instead of just seeing them as statistics. And I helped do my part. Other people help with food security. Other people help get better jobs. Other people help secure housing. But with the resources that they had, I helped them make plans and budgets. And most of them had never had money, so they didn't know what to do with the little that they had. And he said, what really blew me away was the one week where I'm meeting with this family and it had been the third or fourth time I was with them. And I was checking in. That was part of the system we had set up. And the family said to me, you've really helped us know what to do with these few dollars. But more importantly, you've listened to us and we know you love us. And that's made all the difference in the world. Thanksgiving's coming up. Have some comfort stuff, right? If you get to hug someone, hug them. If you can have the pumpkin pie, do not count the calories. Right? Just receive those gifts. But also let this week remind us that we can also have Thanksgiving not just as the holiday, but as a practice every day. And that, like that man was sharing with me, that we can give thanks for what we have, but also ask the question, what are you calling me to do with what you've entrusted 
to me. And then like Jesus says, as you listen, you're part of truth. You're part of getting in on what God's doing. And the more we do that, the better it is for us and for everyone. Thank God. Thank God. Amen.